Well, good morning. How are we doing this morning? I'm just curious, how many here love Jesus? Amen. Amen. That's why we're here, right? To worship and to praise our Father and our God, our Savior, our Lord. Let's get open, let's open up with a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, Lord, this morning as we come on this um, this time to worship and to praise and to give you glory, Father, I just pray, God, that we would do that with a a uh, open heart, open mind, Lord, to your word, that, Father, we might uh, feel the, the love that you have for us today, Lord, and the message and the singing of the songs, Lord, and as we praise and worship you, Father, we give you all the praise and the glory, we give you all praise, and today as we come, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's all stand together, and we're going to sing. When we all get to heaven, what a great hope we have in Christ. Looking forward to that day when we meet everyone up there. Let's all sing together. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy on his grace. the assurance that we have is our confidence and we can rest in his promise of eternal life and this hope that we have never leaves it endures to the end let's sing together blessed assurance Sending green from above, echoes 
of mercy whispers above. This is my story, this is my song. Praise you, my Savior, all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praise you, my Savior. my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Great singing this morning. Now we're going to hear from Heidi. She's prepared a special song for us.
Amen. Thank you so much, Heidi, and everyone from the band. That was amazing. Another special shout out to Heidi. For those of you who are at Trunk, and Tr Trunk or Treat this week, amazing. Couldn't be done. So one more round of applause for Heidi. That was awesome. It was I, there were so many vehicles in the parking lot for Trunk or Treat this week, and I was talking to someone before they even started passing out candy, and they said, how do they do this? Who, who's making all of this possible? And I was like, all of the volunteers and the workers at Jersey, everyone came together. A fantastic event yet again, so thank you so much everyone here at Jersey for making that happen. And it really is one of my favorite events that we do now. Um, Welcome, welcome everyone. My name's Becca and I'm so excited that you are here today. If you are new with us, we would love to know about that. You can text the word new, N-E-W, to 740-457-1525. How many of you have that phone number memorized now? Quite a few, yeah, every week, every week. So that's how you can get a hold of us. We'll let you know about the ministries that we have here at Jersey and hopefully connect you with one that you would like to be involved in. Um, so next week, is time change, and we are going to fall back next week. So if you come at the old 8 o'clock, it will be 7 a.m., we will find a spot for you to volunteer, so still feel free to come at that time. We will get you plugged in, but time change is next week, so don't forget that. Um, the second thing is our memory verse. This is the last Sunday and the last day of October, so we want to go through our memory verse one more time, and that is Romans 15, 13, excuse me, <clears throat> so let's um, read that together now. Are we ready? Okay, let's do it. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe in him. Oh, sorry. Well done. I read a different version on my phone. I will read the prompt on the screen next time. So you guys are the 8 o'clock service, and you get the mess-ups. There we go. So, hey, since that was the last time we're doing that one together, get ready for November. The next verse in November is Psalm 103.12. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I got that one right. Okay, so that is our verse for the month of November. If you want to start reading it and memorizing it, I obviously need to. So Psalm 103.12, it is a good one. So we're looking forward to that. And last but not least, um, we wanted to share a video of hope. Uh, we are doing a year-long uh, focus on hope and the hope that the gospel brings and the hope that believing in Jesus brings. So we want to share a video with you. This is a couple that's just going to share how sometimes when you might feel like there's no hope, knowing that God is there for us is a really great um, way to remember there is hope. And this is uh, Roger and Angie Bias. And we're hoping to share a video like this once each month for the next year. So we really hope that you um, listen to the video and hear about the hope that God provided to them. Okay, so um, first part of August, Roger came home from a ball tournament and said he had a really bad headache, so he was gonna go ahead and go to bed. Um, woke him up the next morning for church and he said, babe, I, I, my head's killing me. I'm okay. So we proceeded to do that for the next two and a half weeks. Um, never had any respiratory issues, but he had a lot of body aches and didn't eat or drink a whole lot. Um, and on a Thursday morning, we woke up and took his pulse um, ox and his um, oxygen level was down to 47. So after he had fought me for a few days, um, he didn't have it in him to fight me anymore. And I called the squad and we got him there and uh, they proceeded to put him on a BiPAP machine, hoping that that would help him. Um, but after some testing and um, taking him upstairs to the critical care unit, he was diagnosed with bilateral pneumonia and COVID. So, um, the next day was a Friday and, you know, they don't let you come in and stay with them. That was probably the hardest part on my end was not being able to care for him um, and just giving it to God because, you know, there's nothing else you can do. And the doctor called and said, I've spoken with your husband. He's a profoundly ill man. And uh, I don't think that he's probably going to pull out of this, um, but we'll do what we can. His heart is strong. And um, little did I know he was flipping through the phone and texting um, something to put on Facebook about um, 
you know, his family and his relationship with Christ. And um, they put him on the ventilator and gave him some paralytics and proned him, turned him over on his stomach. And he stayed that way for nine, 10 days. And we'd get calls from the doctor and the nurses a couple times a day. And um, just the roller coaster ride. And I mean, you truly, you know, just jump on board, Lord help me. There's nothing I can do, it's all in your hands. And um, I had a peace, I, I truly did, um, about the bills, about his, you know, pulling through. I mean, there were a lot of nights I cried because we've been married 35 years and never been apart. So, you know. When I first started coming to, I didn't know how long I'd been there, but I remember praying to give me one more day. Next thing I knew, it had been two days. And I prayed to give me another day, and it had been a week. And now here we are eight weeks out since I asked for one day. So it's humbling, you know, sometimes when prayers are answered. My son's got married since I've been home. I have another grandchild since I've been home. You know, the bill was in excess of $175,000, and they gave us a non-insured discount. Um, that brought it down a little bit, but it was still about 135,000. And, you know, we thought, well, you know, we'll just pay what we can, not stress about it. Um, it is what it is and God's got this. And about uh, two weeks after you'd been home, week, week or two weeks after you got home, we got a letter and they wiped it clean. I took it up to him and I was crying and he was like, you've got to be kidding me. Are you sure? I'm like, that's what it says. I mean, you know, and so little by little, you know, the Lord's just shown, hey, I am here. Hey, you can count on me, you know this. The money thing is baffling to me on the bill, you know. We haven't faithfully tithed since we started going here, but we have been the last five, six years. And well, we're not rich, we're never gonna be rich, but we don't want for nothing. The money always ends up being there. You tithe and money comes in somewhere you're not expecting, you know. You tithe and $175,000 gets wiped out. How's that, how's that happen? <laughs> we, know, we know where our faith is and so thankful, so thankful. I've played softball for 35 years all over the country. And right before going on the ventilator, I made a post letting all my buddies in the softball world, you know, that I've been in contact with, that I love them. I love my family. I said, but above all that, I want all of you to know about my love for Jesus Christ. And I've shared my faith with people before, but I've never been bold and just throw it out there. And when I got out of the hospital and seen that post, it just kind of amazed me that no matter what happened while I was in the hospital, I was gonna let everybody know that above everything in life, anything you like, your family, that that relationship with Christ, you know, everybody can have, you know? You can forgive anything. All you gotta do is ask. I was just floored that I threw that out there in the lowest point of my life, just wanted to share it with everybody. You hear from Angie is exactly how she talked when I was praying with her about what are you going to do financially and she was absolutely confident God has got this pastor I know he does and so uh, an incredible family in our church and for many of you I'm sure you didn't know them previously but you've got to know them uh, by listening um, to this testimony. Now, there's something else I do want to call the church to. Uh, Pastor Matt Reed, uh, his father, Bob, has COVID as well. Uh, his condition is grave. It is extremely serious at this time. And so I would like to lead us in a prayer for him and Pastor Matt would appreciate it so very much. As a matter of fact, Matt was scheduled to preach this Sunday, uh, but 
we encouraged him to go back home to Indiana, uh, be with his mother and family. Uh, so would you join me in a word of prayer? Uh, Holy God, this uh, testimony that we just heard does give us hope in our prayers. Uh, you are a good God, and there is nothing too big or there is no amount too large uh, for you to be able to cover it. And so, God, we lift up Bob to you. We pray for the Reed family. We pray that you will encourage Bob and Lord, at this time when possibly he's unable to even know of what is happening around him, that you might in your mercy uh, spare him. Uh, we understand from the reports the gravity of his condition, um, but Father, you are also a God who can raise the dead. And so, God, we know that COVID pneumonia is no match for you. Uh, we also know that you are God with plans and that you have a will for Bob's life and for his family. And Father, sometimes that is through sickness and it is through um, many hardships. And so God, we trust you. You are good however you answer and however and whenever you heal. And so we lift him up to you. And we ask based on his relationship with you as your son. You love your sons and daughters uniquely. And so we ask that as a loving father, you would heal this son of yours. And we pray in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, this morning I want to talk to you about a subject that hopefully all of you have experienced. And it is forgiveness. It is the forgiveness that God gives to those who by faith trust in the work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. As you recall, last week we talked about the importance of repentance. And repentance is an activity of God in the lives of his sons and daughters. It is impossible for us to be born again without experiencing repentance. Faith and repentance are two sides of the same coin. If you have saving faith, you're going to repent. If you repent unto salvation, you have faith. The two always go together. When we repent and our hearts are moved by the Spirit and the Word, the good news that I get to share with you is that you will be forgiven of all of your sins. Now, this is staggering. Let me share this with you. You will be forgiven of your sins presently. You will be forgiven of your sins in the past. And you will be forgiven of your sins in the future. Is that not staggering? Think about it with me. As God in his immense power and kindness. When we are repentant, placing our faith in his son Jesus Christ, he forgives us of all of our sins. If that does not give you hope, I don't know what will. As we continue in this journey of taking a deep dive into salvation, how it works, what God tells us about it in his word, my hope is, as we look into the 13th chapter, the 13th chapter of the book of Acts, and we look into a segment of the sermon that was preached by the Apostle Paul, many of you are aware of the fact that most theologians would categorize in the ministry of the Apostle three missionary journeys. We have, beginning in chapter 13, the very first missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. Let me refresh your memory. Do you remember who he took that missionary journey with? Well, maybe I should say who he started it with. You'll recall with me that as he began that journey, 
we're told that he started the journey as that process began with Barnabas, the son of encouragement, the apostle Paul. And there was another by the name of John Mark. You'll remember with me that after disembarking from an island in the Mediterranean, they made their way up into what is modern-day Turkey. And as they were at the coast, at the port, something happened. We don't know. John Mark left the missionary team. This caused Paul to be unhappy. After that, the missionaries made the best of it. They were obedient to God, and they moved northbound. And they went up to a city that we would see as being somewhat in the center of Turkey. And it was the city, the city of Antioch. It is referred to as Pisidian Antioch. Now, why do I even mention that? You'll recall with me that that first missionary journey was launched out of the church in Antioch. Well, wait a minute. You said they traveled to Antioch. Well, that's Pisidian Antioch. Are there more than one Columbus as a city? You could end up in Georgia if you're not careful. Yesterday, I was returning from a quick down and back from Florida. Traveled down Wednesday evening, traveled back last evening. And as we landed in Columbus and we were retrieving our bags over the intercom, someone said, they called out a name, Susan Smith, return to gate 25. You are in the wrong city. This is Columbus, Ohio, not Baltimore. Well, hopefully she got on her way to Baltimore. What you need to know is that this is Antioch in Turkey, not Antioch in Syria. And so they traveled now to the city of Antioch, another tidbit that you might like to know. The Apostle Paul would write shortly thereafter the book of Galatians. Galatia was a region, not a city. This Antioch was in the center of Galatia. So the Apostle Paul would go where? When he would go to a city on a missionary journey, he would go first to what people group? He would go first to the Jews. And so he would go to a synagogue. So the Apostle Paul goes to a synagogue. He begins preaching. Chapter 13 records his sermon. This is powerful. If you've ever dreamed, Lord, do us a favor. Replace our pastor with the Apostle Paul. Well, today is your day. Because you can get the sermon of the Apostle Paul if you'll simply take the time to read much of chapter 13. And so as the Apostle builds for us a case... He looks into the Old Testament. He recounts Jewish history. He uses multiple resources of Holy Scripture, what we would refer to as the Old Testament. And then he does, as Paul always does, he does something I refer to as drawing the net. He tells the people about the Messiah coming. And then he says to them, once they understand that Messiah came, that he went to a cross, that he died, and he was buried. Then Paul says, would you believe this? And if you will, God will forgive you. I want to encourage you today. If you are somewhat diminished in hope, maybe your hope has been depleted recently. There is something that helps us to have an abiding eternal hope. And it is the knowledge from the word of God about what happens to those 
that are truly born again and saved. Our sins are forgiven. All of them. Those things that were hidden. Those things that embarrass us. Those things that may have ruined our reputation. God, when he forgives us, he forgives us of all our sins. That's, that's a source of hope. Pick up with me for the sake of time in verse 38 of chapter 13. Therefore, therefore, let it be known to you, brothers and sisters, that through this man, forgiveness of sins is being proclaimed to you. Now, before you can experience forgiveness of sins, you must first admit that you are a sinner and you need forgiveness. I don't know if this has happened. It happens at our home. Our children might come home for a holiday. Jan labors long and hard to make sure they have a good meal. Everyone eats, they're full, and then Jan says, wouldn't you like seconds? Now, the children and grandchildren have eaten all they wanted, but Mama always wants to offer them more. When you think about what God is saying to us in this text, He is saying to you and to me that our sins can be forgiven, all of them. And some of us have experienced that. But if you haven't experienced that, I want to encourage you this morning, consider the call of the Spirit and dine at his table, and delight in his forgiveness, embrace his goodness, and eat to overfilling of the grace of Almighty God. God is gracious and kind to people who are sinners. Now, some of you would understand, but possibly there is someone here today who has not embraced the forgiveness of Christ and hasn't confessed their sinfulness. My hope is that you will not be in denial about your spiritual condition, that you would accept and embrace the truth that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Don't compare yourself to someone else because we don't get into heaven by comparing ourselves to someone who attends church at Jersey. You can't say, God, I'm better than they are. I know they attended church every Sunday, but I know some things about them. That's not going to get you into heaven. I love what the psalm says in Psalm 103. Would you turn there with me? You're going to underline it in your Bible if you haven't already. Psalm 103, beginning in verse 8. Some of you may be making the connection. Becca shared with us a portion of this passage. Psalm 103. This is good news for people who know that they need to be forgiven of their sins. Psalm 103, beginning in verse 8. The Lord is compassionate and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in faithful love. He will not always accuse us or be angry forever. He has not dealt with us as our sins deserve or repaid us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above, so great is his faithful love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, 
so far he has removed our transgressions from us. Is there a witness in church today? Has that, has that happened to you? Have you by faith turned to Christ and asked him for forgiveness of your sins? And if you have done that, this merciful, compassionate God forgives us. I, I love that. As far as the east is from the west, the two will never meet. That's how far he has removed our transgressions. The preaching of the forgiveness of sins was a vital part of the preaching that you find in the book of Acts. The very first sermon that you see in the book of Acts was preached not by Paul, but it was preached by Peter. In chapter 2, verse 38, listen to the words of Peter. Re Peter replied, repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You remember when we talked about repentance last week, we talked about Cornelius, Acts chapter 11. In Acts chapter 10, we also have the first account of the gospel being proclaimed to Cornelius and his family. Look at verse 43 in chapter 10. All the prophets testify about him that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. The apostle Paul concluding his missionary journeys in Acts 26 verse 18 he shares about his conversion and his calling. He writes this beginning in verse 17. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a share among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Paul, when he was preaching to the church at Ephesus in chapter 1, verse 7, it records how he proclaimed forgiveness of sins. Verse 7 of Ephesians chapter 1, In him we have, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. All of your sins are forgiven when by faith you repent and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now going back to chapter 13, you looked at the content. The primary content of verse 38 is your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Peter preached, your sins, when you trust by faith in Christ, your sins are forgiven. You look at the, at the preaching of Paul on multiple occasions. When you trust, when you believe in Christ, your sins are forgiven. Then notice what happens in verse 39. There's the transition away from the experience of forgiveness of our sins to justification. Verse 39. Everyone who believes, everyone who believes is justified through him from everything that you could not be justified from through the law of Moses. Let me just give you a simple definition of justification. Are you ready? I'll go ahead and read it to you. This is by George Eldon Ladd, a great theologian. He wrote this. He said, simply put, to justify is to declare righteous. To justify is to declare righteous. Here's a way to help you understand justification. The Holy Spirit, this is the, the experience of salvation. You come to a church like Jersey. You are not happy with the direction of your life. For some reason or another, you choose to go into that church that you've driven by a hundred times on your way 
to work. You pull in, you walk into the church, the people are friendly enough. So you find a place to sit, not too close, because you don't know what the preacher will be like. So you get a safe distance away from the preacher. The, mu- the music is exceptional. It tugs at your heart. There's something that you haven't felt before going on deep in your soul. Convicting power of the Holy Spirit. And so as you're listening to the music and you hear the prayers that are prayed and then the preacher gets up and opens up the word of God the power of Scripture to bring conviction. Now the Holy Spirit is saying to you, you need to turn your life around. You're going in the wrong direction. And suddenly, you have this sense of hope that what you're hearing, this Jesus that you were taught about as a child, that he really does care about you. And so convicted by the Spirit and the Word, the music and the Word in print, you suddenly have this sense that this Jesus is able to rescue you. So now you cry out to God and you say, I believe and I turn to you God, I am sorry for the sins that are weighing me down. Forgive me. And as God hears your prayer, he then from heaven, when by faith you have repented, he says to you, you were condemned. You were heading in the wrong direction. But because of turning into that parking lot, following the word of God and the spirit of God. Now you've believed. And from heaven, you know what God says to you? Not guilty any longer. There is a declaration from heaven about you. He then imputes the righteousness of Jesus to you. His righteousness is deposited in your soul's account. Is that not amazing? Justification is when you hear from heaven, when you repent of your sins and believe in the work of Christ upon the cross, heaven declares, John Hayes, not guilty, forgiven. And now I'm justified. If you would, I'd like to read further about George Eldon Ladd's comments because they are excellent. He writes, Justification is an act of God whereby he pronounces a sinner to be righteous because of the sinner's faith in Christ. The root idea in justification is the declaration of God, the righteous judge, The man who believes in Christ, sinful though he may be, is righteous. He is viewed as being righteous because in Christ he has come into a righteous relationship with God. Properly understood, justification has to do with God's declaration about the sinner. That is justification. It doesn't transform a person so that they are as holy as they will be one day in this world. It simply declares him not guilty before God. The actual change toward holiness in the sinner occurs, this is important, with sanctification which is related to justification, but is distinct from it. Does that make sense? You repent, 
You believe. God declares you forgiven. Your sins are cleansed. Remember, though they be as crimson, they shall be as white as snow. And so your sins are forgiven. God says to you and me, you're forgiven. The pronouncement from the judgment seat of God. Once we're forgiven, here's the next thing that happens to us. He gives us his Holy Spirit. Now, this is glorious because you came into this church not knowing what you were going to get. You were hoping you might leave feeling better than when you came here. But now you've experienced salvation. And so you have this euphoric feeling, the burden, the weight has been lifted off of your shoulders. And that was the burden and the guilt of sin. You know that there were things that you should have never done, but now you sense that you're, gosh, I feel that forgiveness and I feel like I'm born again. I'm a new person. And you are. And so you don't worry about going to heaven one day and standing before God and him saying to you, get out of here. I don't want anything to do with you because you've already received the verdict. And the verdict is not guilty. And then God says to you, I want you to become like my son. And you will represent me here on this earth. And so I'm going to transform you so that you look like the one that you just committed your life to. And that is sanctification. And so how do you do it? You say, well, I could never do that. I know the truth about me. I wake up every day and have to look in the mirror. I know how miserable I am and how weak I am. I can never be like Jesus. Oh, yes, you can, because now the Holy Spirit lives in you. And so the journey called sanctification begins at conversion. And listen to me. It is never finished until glorification. And that occurs when Jesus comes back again. Oh, friend, you will always have cause for hope, no matter how bad things get on this earth, if you understand what God does for those that he redeems. And you will eternally be a frustrated person writhing in your sense of regret and remorse and I can never do enough if you try to make peace with God on your terms. If you believe the false religion that you can be right with God through works, it's an impossibility. Oh, I pray that the world does not deceive you so that it confuses you so that you don't realize your need to repent to experience forgiveness and be born again let me pray with you father i thank you for the gospel of jesus christ that never gets old and god as we review from scripture what you do for us in saving us it does give us hope concerning the future now, Father, um, your altar is open. We proclaim that. And we also proclaim that there's power in prayer. And so, God, we pray for the saints uh, that they might take the opportunity to pray. I pray for those people that don't know you, Christ, who have never given you control of their life, that today they would be saved that they would be born again. They'd repent of their sin. They'd cry out to you in faith and experience the new birth. 
We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for that message from Pastor John. And if you did make a decision today or you want to make a decision, we think now is a great time to do that. And we would love to hear about that. If you decided to follow Jesus, made a decision, or you just want to tell us what's going on and what God is doing in your life, we would love to hear about it. You can text us at 740-457-1525. We would love to hear from you and pray for you and with you. Um, there's so many different ways you can get a hold of us throughout the week. I'm going to read them to make sure that I get it right. You can email us at email at jerseychurch.org or you can